and you are here at Chicago Bike Week. Um, today we are talking about buses and bikes creating a transportation ecosystem. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have here Jen Henry of the Chicago Transit Authority. We have Amanda Woodall of CDOT and Divi. We have Bennett Haller of Cook County Department of Transportation and Highways. And we are so lucky to have all three of them here today to be talking a little bit about um, buses and bikes and, and transit and creating, creating a multimodal uh, world here in Chicago. So um, each of them is going to offer a brief presentation and then we'll dive into some questions and uh, we hope to hear from you in the audience. If you have any questions at any time, you can use the chat or the Q&A box on the bottom bar. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with you, Bennett. I didn't realize I was first. All right, um, I'm, I, that's fine, that's fine, okay. I'm ready. Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Bennett Haller. Uh, I am with the Cook County Department of Transportation and Highways. Uh, I actually work in both bike and transit planning. And in fact, we are working on a bike and transit plan. I have a short presentation, but it has a lot of slides. So I'm going to talk really fast and go through a lot of slides very quickly because that's what I do. Um, so we did a 2016 plan called Connecting Cook County. This was the first tra uh, transportation plan our county had done in uh, 70 years. And four of the five uh, priorities are relevant here. We want to prioritize transit and other transportation alternatives. We want to promote equal access to opportunities, recognizing the inequities in the existing system. We'd like to maintain and modernize what already exists. Why reinvent the wheel? Just make the existing wheel better. And in general, we want to increase investments in transportation, particularly in the case of our department, in things not really related to our road specifically. So uh, the Cook County Transit Plan, this is underway and projected to finish sometime in the spring of next year. Uh, one of the, oops, sorry about that. One of the things we wanna acknowledge of course is Cook County is the center of a tri-state transportation network. Within the county itself, we have 300 train stations, uh, Metra, Amtrak, CTA, NICTI, uh, or, or um, what am I missing? Uh, anyway, uh, and serving 5.2 million residents within our county. So we are more than half the metro area population and certainly the densest part and the most railroad oriented part of the county. Um, over time, over the 50, over 50 years, jobs and employment have actually moved more Northwest as, as has population sort of away from transit assets. So in areas in red have lost, have lost employment, areas in green have gained employment. So what this is showing in general is employment has moved. Uh, the downtown remains pretty robust, Hyde Park remains robust, but other parts of the, of the Chicago and adjacent suburbs have really lost a lot of jobs. So really moving away from transit, both jobs and, um, and residents is really bad. Uh, in terms of using our transit system. And in particular, this has a major impact on the southern parts of Chicago and South Cook County, uh, where uh, unemployment is very high, people don't own cars, uh, and getting and taking transit to jobs is very time consuming. So uh, in the end, uh, we really want to target uh, initiatives that really serve the populations that have the most disadvantages as it relates to the transit network and access to jobs. Um, so uh, three of the, the three main goals of the transit plan are to increase the the overall ridership on the transit network to increase the seamlessness of transit service that fare media works across Metro and CTA, that fares are capped as part of a link continuous trips, that Divi is somehow incorporated into the venture system and you get some kind of discount. Um, Amanda might speak to that too. And we wanna make, make sure we are focusing on the needs of the most transportation reliant communities, people of lower income with some of the really most awful commutes in the entire metro area. So one thing we've already kicked off this uh, this year, starting in January, is this fare transit pilot in which we basically lowered the fare for all trips taken on Metro Electric or Rock Island across the entire system in Will and Cook County, uh, basically reducing it to the reduced fare so uh, you can pay half regardless of what uh, kind of ticket you buy. Uh, and this will run for three years. And then further, we've also improved service on the Pace 352 bus, which goes between the Chicago Heights Transportation Center and the 95th CTA Red Line Station. So facilitating movements of people uh, and hits many metro stations on the way. 
Um, just this is a map just to show you where Cook County owned and maintained roads are. Some of you probably know, because uh, you're nerds, uh, that Western and Ashland are also owned by Cook County in Chicago, uh, in Chicago but we do not maintain those roads. Uh, CDOT maintains those roads. So this is showing you only those roads that are both Cook County roads and maintained by us. So as you can see, they are not in Chicago. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, some some of them have Metra, uh, uh, sorry, some of them has pay routes on them as indicated in green. Then a handful up around Skokie actually have CTA service. But uh, if we're trying to uh, improve the transit network, we can only go so far with our own roads, but we wanna make sure that where we do have uh, facilities that they're more accessible. We definitely wanna support uh, bus pri priorities in various ways, be it on the CTA system or on the, on the pace uh, pulse system. So we do recognize certain corridors and other corridors as CTA or pace may deem uh, where we want to make uh, sure we're improving them on a, as regional routes. Uh, we want to be aware of how the bike network relates to the transit network, uh, particularly we want to make sure that connections from bike to transit are easy, that Divi uh, stations exist, that you can get uh, that you, you get some kind of fair benefit by using Divi, that bike parking is available, that you can put your bike on trains or cars, and also in general to enhance the low stress network because I think that'll appeal to the uh, greatest number of Chicagoans uh, and Cook County residents. Um, we, as it relates to our transit plan, we are uh, sort of in early, early stages of stakeholder in, engagement. Uh, we have done some uh, interaction as part of uh, Transport Chicago and other meetings, and we will continue to have uh, public community meetings uh, in the future. Uh, and also, uh, we uh, have been working with various advisory committees. Uh, quickly onto the bike plan, uh, through Invest in Cook, we have recognized that uh, there are places uh, we want to, uh, that where uh, communities want uh, transportation infrastructure. Uh, we've had this program running since 2017, uh, $8.5 million grant program for uh, communities and organizations like Active Trans to, to do planning and, and, and various kinds of transportation in, in infrastructure improvements. We've spent uh, approximately uh, 12, uh, 10 million, sorry, $11 million on bike ped projects over the first four years of the project uh, in the south suburbs uh, and northwest suburbs primarily. Uh, one highlight of this is in fact, uh, creating greater connectivity along the CalSAG trail and ultimately closing the gap on the Burnham Greenway. But I think a key point in our bike planning efforts is to recognize when you think about the biking community in the county or anywhere in the US, um, a, a large part of that population would fall in the category of interested but concerned. That's to say, uh, people who bike a little bit, but don't necessarily want to bike on major streets. Um, but, uh, you know, oftentimes in the bike planning effort, what you hear from the most are in the bottom two categories, cyclists who bike very frequently, who are comfortable biking on major arterial streets and want to have improvements in, in those locations where they bike. And let me be clear, I'm all about bike safety. But I just want to make it clear that in some cases, in terms of serving the most people in the county, uh, a lot of arterial street and major road infrastructure is not necessarily appealing uh, to the entire population. I just uh, took this directly from an MDOT report on road crossings, but this is sort of giving a breakdown of those various populations. They use slightly different categories, but the, the highest uh, category here being experienced and confident, and then the casual and somewhat confident, maybe 8% of the population, but then a good 60% of the population would fall in this interested but concerned category. And in general, what they want is uh, uh, to bike on lower stress elements of the bike network. So not necessarily on major arterial streets. And then there's a good 30% of the adult population not interested in biking. This is a, a brand new graphic I just created where I'm trying to talk a little bit about the, the stress level of various types of bike infrastructure. So where can you legally bike? You can legally bike on off street paved trails. You can bike on side paths. You can bike on residential streets. You can bike on arterial and major streets, but the level of stress uh, across those uh, various kinds of infrastructure varies and trails and side paths can be the least stressful. Um, arterial streets can be the most stressful and industrial streets can be the most stressful. And then my question in, in this image is, what is sort of Milwaukee Avenue? How uh, less stressful is that with the bike infrastructure and who does that appeal to? And, and I guess my basic point I'm trying to make here is that in the end, uh, no, no matter what we do on arterial streets to make them safer, that's not appealing to necessarily to the majority of people who bike simply because um, they don't wanna bike on the arterial street. So one thing we've done in the bike plan is to document where the existing off street network is, both the lakefront trail, uh, paved trails and forest preserves and local park districts and stuff. We've mapped about 500 miles of trails and noticed that there are 
huge holes uh, in the southern and western parts of the county and, and within Chicago itself. Um, we want to document those. We want to talk about where expansions are going to occur. And as much as possible, we want to think about how the off-street network then transitions to low-stress streets where off-street options aren't available. So here we are documenting where some of the existing trails are, and we've gone further with that. As it relates to our second goal, equitable, equitable investments, we, want, we are able to map residents' access to trails by race and ethnicity. There are serious imbalances right now. White and Asian residents of Chicago have much, uh, Cook County have much better access to trails than Latino or African-American populations. Specific projects like the Little Village Paseo, uh, Pilsen Paseo can do a large uh, part in actually addressing inequities as that would actually increase the number of Latinos with access to the trail by 126,000, disproportionately benefiting Latino populations. So, uh, and the last goal, everyday cycling, uh, this is really where we want the most help. We, you know, we want to make improvements uh, within Chicago and, and areas uh, where there are not off-street opportunities. How do we connect those? This is really showing the designated boulevards in Chicago with the idea that that might be a nice low-stress connector to uh, to the um, lakefront and to the trails that exist outside the city. But in general, you know, what can we do uh, to improve infrastructure to serve cyclists, with, whether it be bike racks, whether it be improved facilities around transit stations, uh, what can we do to do that? And then one tool we're trying to develop is working with uh, some of our major agencies like the Forest Preserve and CDOT to uh, develop a countywide counting program. So just very quickly, one thing I would observe about Chicago and the county is you have, on the, as it relates to major streets, you have these north, south, and east, west streets indicated in red, and you have these diagonal streets indicated here in purple. With the diagonal streets, there really aren't alternatives. So that's why in often cases you have on Lake Street, Archer and Clark and Milwaukee, you have bike infrastructure and you have transit infrastructure. I would also point out on some of these uh, orthogonal streets, the east, west and north, south streets. In many cases, there are alternative routes for cyclists to take. And in some cases, like on Western, for example, maybe we don't put bike lanes on Western because we're favoring the bus and we uh, actually think more about California as a, an alternative. But with diagonal streets, oftentimes there is no alternative. And that's one, one reason why I think these are very interesting areas for investigation of infrastructure, really in ways that promote both use by bikes and bus, uh, that is a very hard challenge to design those appropriately. Uh, so where we are now, uh, we are doing interest group meetings. We are planning an open house on July 13th, and we'll issue a nurse survey at that time. Uh, those are the very those are the dates for the open house on the 13th and 14th. Um, we have a social pinpoint site, which I'm happy to share in the chat. And I'm done talking. Thank you. Thank you, Bennett. That was a tremendous amount of information. Um, I'm sure uh, folks can explore the two links Maggie just dropped in the chat of the transit plan and the bike plan. Um, and uh, stay tuned for the question and answer section. So next up, we have Amanda, um, and you will also be sharing slides, yes? Yeah. Yes, right. yes, I will. Okay. Shall I begin? All right. So bear with me one moment while we all look at the beautiful Chicago skyline. Um, All right, so my name is Amanda Woodall. I am the program director for the Divi bike sharing system at uh, the Chicago Department of Transportation. Not a lot of people realize that Divi is a city owned system. Um, our current uh, contractor who runs the system is Lyft and they are our operator as well as our sponsor. So um, just an important piece that not a lot of people have that grasp of um, that relationship and the fact that Divi is city owned. Um, I'm gonna start by just giving you kind of some of the, some of the basics, uh, Divi by the numbers. You may already know everything about Divi and use Divi all the time, but not all of everybody knows the details of our system and our reach. So we're currently at 155 square miles, which is the largest geographic footprint of any bike sharing system in North America. And we continue to grow with our citywide expansion, which I'll talk a little bit about next. We currently have a little over 690 active stations in Chicago, and there are 14 stations in Evanston, um, where Evanston did buy into the, um, did buy into the system a couple of years ago. Uh, we have about 6,000 pedal bikes in our fleet and 3,500 e-bikes, which will also continue to grow this year as we continue to expand the system. 49 million miles traveled, um, 26 million trips, and the majority of those are member trips. Um, 
19 million being for you know annual Divi members and 7 million for casual. Um, but it is um, it's 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 interesting because um, and I'm, this is not a presentation about the impacts of COVID. But one of the things that really um, is unique about looking at the data from the last year is that uh, the number of casual trips really really increased and the number of the miles traveled per trip by members also increased. So it showed that a lot of people were definitely using the system in different ways. So I was asked to give a quick overview of just a little bit of how the system has grown over time. There will be a couple slides on this. So when you look at this um, map here to the right, you'll see that the blue area was our initial launch area. Uh, Divi was launched um, in 2013 with federal funding, um, started with 75 stations going live at once and then grew to 300 in that first year. Our second deployment in 2015 added another 150 stations in the pink areas that you see shaded here. 2016, we went through the west side. Um, at the time, Oak Park was also in our system, although they did not stay in for more than one year. Um, but we also added, you know, all the other green um, all the other little dots with the green areas that you see here. And then in 2018, we did do an optimization to try to increase density in a lot of areas where um, the station density just wasn't to par in the way that we wanted for a dock to dock pedal um, pedal bike system. So, um, and then down here at the bottom, you'll see um, what I'm going to expound on on the next slide, which is our system expansion. So as I mentioned, um, Lyft is our operator and also our sponsor. And because of their $50 million capital investment, we're able to go citywide. One of the reasons it took us so many years to put down the stations we had up till then was because um, federal funding is something that um, has a lot of unique qualifications and a lot of unique processes that you have to go through in order to move things forward. Um, and with Lyft sponsorship money, we have more flexibility and we're able to move much, much more fast. Um, so the blue area here um, that you see at the bottom of the map is our far south side system expansion area. We are just wrapping that up with 77 locations. And this year we're moving on to phase two, which will be about 107 locations. And then uh, 2022 will be these gray shaded areas. Um, and then I also thought I'd give you just a little bit more of a closer look at the communities that we'll be serving with our phase two expansion. And we are gonna be getting ready to lay some stations down here in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. Um, so, and not only is this system expanding, but it's also undergoing a major technology upgrade. Um, the blue classic pedal bikes that everyone knows and loves, um, they're three speed and up until last year, our whole paradigm for the way that the system functioned was that you needed to have stations, right? You've got the blue bikes, they go from one station to another station. And if you don't have a station in your neighborhood, then you're, um, you know, or, or one nearby, then you're not really able to access the service. But last year, um, Lyft began to integrate these black hybrid electric e-bikes into the system. So they do have a battery pack um, with a pedal assist. So that means that when you get on and you start riding, um, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a, a boost that kicks in as you're pedaling and automatically assists you up to 20 miles per hour. It was 15 miles an hour very recently. Um, in addition to that, we consider that to be a major game changer for people who haven't ridden a bike in many years um, or for people who may face other types of barriers for getting on bikes. But in addition to that, they also all have this built in um, hybrid onboard cable locking mechanism, which means that the bikes can either lock up, um, they can still all lock to a traditional Divi station, but it means that they can also lock up to a public bike rack, to a signpost, to any other legal bike parking space. And it means that our expansion consists of, you know, two different types of infrastructure. So on the right, you have the traditional heavyweight Divi station with the kiosk and the solar panel and the ad panel, and it's requires a crane truck and a flatbed truck and all of this energy to, to get it laid out. Um, but in our expansion areas, the primary usage is e-bikes. And so what that means is we're able to um, Lyft was able to design this sort of what we're calling a lightweight station that accommodates the e-bikes. And you can see this close up 
um, sort of diagram of how the new locking me mechanism fits into the station. So as we talk about expansion, um, we're, we're pleased to be able to include these in the model because it's a lot lighter weight. Uh, they can be installed with two guys and a pickup truck. And it means that we're really bringing the e-bikes, which are the highest, you know, most cutting edge, like the, the new wave in micromobility, as they call it. And we're able to bring those to all of our expansion communities. So, and something I always talk about every time I talk about Divi, not a lot of people are aware, but we do have a program that is a subsidized membership option. So um, if you wanted to become an annual member of Divi, you would need to pay $108 for an annual membership, which is a great deal when you consider that um, it comes to just you know pennies a day and you do get an unlimited number of trips up to 45 minutes. Um, but we recognize that that is also, a you know, in lump sum, that's also a financial barrier for a lot of people. So we do have the Divi for Everyone program. People can sign up in person at specific locations. They can also qualify online. Anybody who has a link card uh, qualifies for, you know, any other public benefits can get in. So wanted to make sure that people are aware of this program and you can go to divibikes.com slash D4E to get the information on that. So that was my Divi heavy explanation. And I realized that I'm actually here to talk about transit. So um, a couple of stats that I wanted to go ahead and pull was just like talk about how close Divi stations are in proximity to other you know, transit stops and transit stations. Um, it's something that we totally prioritize in our planning. Anytime that we're looking at a new community area and trying to determine, you know, where are we gonna put all these dots on the map? Um, we always start with transit connections. So um, just wanted to, you know, highlight here that, um, there are 97% you know, of our Divi stations are within a quarter mile of a, tr of a, of a bus stop and 26% within a train. So um, like a, you know, a, the CTA L. So it's kind of an interesting, um, it's an interesting thing when you realize just how there are bus stops everywhere all around us throughout our communities. Um, but for a lot of people commuting by transit is only a you know, a train oriented activity. So that's, um, that's something that's always been really interesting to me. Um, but meanwhile, you know, we can, we can flip that and say 98% of our train stops have a Divi station nearby. So we do have them all mostly covered as we continue to expand. Um, and then for Metra, it's, um, it's, it's sort of the same thing. There just aren't as many, you know, obviously rail is not as close of a, um, of a resource in communities as, as the bus. So um, again, it's something that we do prioritize. And I mean, I think something that's important that we wanna make sure we talk to everybody about, including, you know, community members and expansion areas, um, you know, most people, there are many people who really only see Divi or biking as a, um, as a leisure or health activity, right? There are all sorts of use, ca use cases. Um, many people who just, they're only gonna ride on a trail. That's the only time that they're ever gonna ride a bike. Um, they wanna ride with their families. They want it to be, you know, um, something that they're doing for their own health and well-being as opposed to getting around. But in addition to that, um, it's important to express how the connection between Divi and transit can really help to boost quality of life and people's access. So for instance, if you have a family, let's say you've got a family, dad works, mom stays home with the kids and they have one car and dad drives that car to work every day because of the distance, because it's so far away and taking transit, um, you know, like he works a late shift. If he's taking transit home, maybe he can take a train, you know, down to his main, you know, down to a main arterial near his house, but the bus service really slows down late at night, right? Um, with Divi, that means that maybe one or two days a week, that trip is actually doable, uh, that he wouldn't have to stand and wait for transit at night, but he would be able to, you know, reduce his trip from a train and a bus to a bus and one bike ride, or uh, two buses to just one bike ride. So these are the kinds of options that we want people to be able to see, um, even though there are many people who are not going to adopt Divi as like their everyday commuting option, um, there are ways to have it be there to, to help smooth things over. And if, you know, one or two days a week, mom gets to keep the car at home, that means she can take the kids to the grocery store or get to the grocery store, take the kids to a doctor's office, um, you know, or run some of those other errands. So that's just sort of like one, one case study, one, one use study that I like to, um, to talk about in order to help people understand how that, how that connection can work. Um, 
there's also some design uh, items that I had to share here that were provided to me by the CDOT Bikeways team. So when it comes to actual operations of bikes and buses together on the same corridor, such as Milwaukee Avenue, um, there, you know, it's obviously a great synergy for getting people moving around from one place to another. However, it is also an opportunity for conflicts, right? We know this when you're riding a bike down the road and the bus is coming up, passing you on the left, you're doing this sort of leapfrogging action where the bus is going to pull over into the bus stop and then you're going to have to merge out and pass. Um, so there have been some things that have been done um, to try to explore that and come up with some creative solutions. On the left-hand side is a picture of the loop link, which this is on Washington and LaSalle, um, just right over by where I am. Uh, you can see City Hall in the background here. And this is an example of a very heavy investment, right? We have this bus only, um, this bus only lane here with this heavy raised uh, station for people to be able to access it um, safely. And then this corridor uh, that's curbside so that cyclists are able to travel along the travel way without conflicting with um, buses. So that's like the sort of Cadillac model of this, right? It's been built out and super robust. On the right is an example of another intersection that's along a barrier protected bikeway on Milwaukee Avenue at Carpenter. And this is a raised, um, a raised bus stop island. So it's a little tough to see in this photo, but you'll see, you know, there's a bus stop sign here. This is where the bus is pulling over. But what this island does is create a space for people to wait for transit and wait for the bus out here on the island. They can cross out across, there's a marked crossing here, and the cyclists can continue to cross um, over that path. Obviously, any intersection is a conflict point. And so it is on cyclists to keep an eye out for the people who are going to be crossing back and forth here. But that's just one of the solutions that we've tried to come up with in order to maintain that clear flow on the roadway. And then here's another example. Um, so on Milwaukee Avenue near Maplewood, just south of the Congress Theater, you, some of you may recognize this. Um, obviously, there was a major um, a major bikeways installation that was just completed very recently along there. And this is an example of um, of a station that is currently being designed and that they hope to implement next year. So you can see it's the same concept where cyclists are flowing behind the station. And then there are these crossing points where people, um, you know, transit riders waiting for the bus are able to cross here. Um, and there is also, by the way, a Divi station over here around the corner. So in case anybody wants to ride to that location and then switch modes, or if they're getting off the bus at Milwaukee Avenue at the end of the day, they can switch uh, to Divi at the end of the day for that. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for this type of work to happen under the um, under the capital bond, the bikeways team is definitely looking for more opportunities to be able to include these, um, these, these types specific these types of you know this bus stop model um, in different locations throughout the city. So pretty excited about getting those things planned and having those things come out for next year. I am concerned that I may have gone over time, so I am going to stop sharing now. But um, my contact information is here. Anybody, please feel free to email me. Uh, email is best. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about Divi or the system-wide expansion. And I'll go ahead and, and stop. Thanks. Thank you so much, Amanda. All really fascinating stuff and exciting stuff happening. Um, next, we have Jen from CTA. Take it away. Hi, well, Amanda, don't worry about going over because you showed two examples that I had pulled up on Google Maps to show people, but you did it in a more polished way. So, so thanks. Um, so what I most want to start with first, if I can figure out how to screen, share my screen. Hold on. Actually, not this. But see, here's the things I was going to show. I will show, this is just because I have it on Street View, you can see how it works a little bit more than the one that Amanda was just talking about. So um, this is the Carpenter one. So you can see a bike back there um, and the bus stop is on the actual island. Um, but you will notice that there is only one traveling, right, um, in that direction. So that's not a solution that can always fit in gracefully and also leave more than one traveling, which in some cases is fine. but. Um, not always. So what I really wanted to show you guys back, just backing up to the uh, the opening, right? If you want to load your bike onto a bus and you want to practice without 
bus driver singing at you and dancing around you. Um, CTA headquarters, this is CTA headquarters. Uh, it's 567 West Lake. It's on the corner of Jefferson and Lake. It's right near the Green Line Clinton stop. Um, and you can't see it very well, but can you guys see my pointer? Pointer, yeah. So there's a little bus decal on the window. And um, here, that works a little bit. Uh, and there's a little rack that you can practice with. Um, so if you've ever been intimidated about putting your bike on, your, on the bus, but it would actually be a convenience to you, you can go and practice there. Um, so I wanted to get that out of the way. So, um, so I'm Jennifer Henry, I'm the uh, Senior Manager for Strategic Planning focused on bus at CTA. Um, and I don't have slides prepared. Um, so you guys are gonna maybe look at this for a little while uh, while I chat and make some of my points. Um, so I think overall, you know, buses and bikes really can and should be allies get along really well, right? Um, because they're, you know, they're key for sustainability, they're key for reducing traffic, they're key for having options, they're key for having cost-effective options for traveling around the city um, that, that everyone can afford. Um, but they do share uh, two things, right? They share the same space typically, which is the curbside. Um, and they share the same roughly average speed, but in different ways, right? The buses go a little fast and then they stop and pull over. And then whereas the bicyclists are going steady. So, you know, if you have cycled on bus routes in Chicago, you have probably experienced the sort of like hop scotching thing. If it's a, you know, especially if it's a frequent bus route, you will run into buses and it's, it's not the most, um, not the most stress-free way to bike, right? And it's not stress-free for the bus operators either, just to be there, right? Especially if there's really high bike usage. Um, I don't know, I have been on the Halstead bus many times where it seemed like it was like a meteor shower of cyclists kind of like coming around the bus. Um, it, it is stressful for the operators and it does sometimes lead to them sort of like slowing down, right? Um, so we, we do wanna work, we have been working with CDOT for a while and figuring out how to, how to make sure we have good options for everyone that work well, that are stress-free for everybody. Um, the bike, the, we call them boarding islands. So the, the Carpenter Milwaukee example and the one that Amanda showed from Maplewood. Um, and then Loop Link is another, really that's an example of a boarding island too. It just has a lot of other features, right? So those are the kinds of things that can really make both modes work together well. Um, there is not, as I sort of referenced, there is not always room for both on every street, right? And that sort of like perfectly souped up, um, really like nicely designed everything, right? Like if you guys are planning nerds, anybody listening, you probably familiar with street mix, which helps you, you can like lay out street configurations, right? So, you know, sidewalk, landscaping, room for shelter, light poles, uh, here's a, this one is a sh shared bus bike lane, but it could also be a, a bus lane, right? And I'll speak to shared lanes in a minute. Travel lane, travel and turn lane, parking lane, more landscaping. Oh, there's landscaping there too. Bike lane, um, you know, it, it adds up. Um, <laughs> and in this particular example, right, you have the bike lane in one direction and, but, but no bus lane in the other direction, right? So, I mean, this is the example they have on their, on their site, just so you can see all the different features, but like not every street has room for every single one of these things. Um, so, you know, Chicago has a lot of arterial streets that are pretty similar in nature, right? Where you have maybe two travel lanes and a parking lane, maybe you have some landscaping, maybe you don't. Um, and, and you can only sort of um, convert so much before you, you start um, impacting either travel or parking. Now, I think many people on the call are probably fine with some additional impacts to parking or, or traveling, but um, it's, the, it's the world we live in. We have to figure these things out, right? So I think for me, and I think a lot of, uh, a lot of planners at CTA, one of the, one of the strategies that um, we'd really like to, to move forward is sort of, you know, not a complete street on every single street, right, in, in terms of this kind of complete street with every single item, but a complete network where sort of as Bennett was um, describing, right, you have one parallel street that is maybe prioritized a little bit more for the bus and then the street next over is prioritized for the bike so that everyone has good routes to get away that, that are relatively low stress instead of, um, you know, trying to pack everything into the same street. Um, so that's, that's, I mean, I don't have too much to say that, that Amanda and Bennett didn't already sort of cover, um, just that like we, we want to work towards making buses and bikes work 
well together and sometimes on the same road and sometimes on different roads. Um, the bus bike, the bus bike shared lane thing was the only other thing that uh, Julie mentioned folks might be interested in hearing about. So there are two, maybe three little tiny bus bike shared lanes in the city that not everybody knows about, partly because the pavement markings might be a little faded in places. Um, but Clark Street, um, uh, peak hour around Lincoln Park, Clark Street, uh, there's a there's segments where during rush hour it's supposed to be bus and bike only where the parking is restricted, right? Um, and then on Portland, I think there's an all day one bus bike shared lane. So we do have a couple and we experimented a little bit more with them a few years back um, when the Chicago Ave Avenue Bread Bridge was under construction. We um, implemented a temporary bus bike shared lane on Halstead because not only were the Halstead buses um, going to continue on it, but the, the, the Chicago buses were going to be rerouting up to division on that sec segment of Halstead between division and Chicago. Um, so we implemented pretty pretty low um, low implementation costs, but but it still involved some bollards or um, are they called bollards? The flexible ones, the flexible posts. Um, flexible so delineators. Delineators. Oh. Delineators. Was the word I was looking for? Um, yes. Yeah, so we did those, and what there was an existing bike lane right on Halstead in that area, um, and it was converted to a bus bike shared lane for for that time, um, and it worked pretty well. It was in the late fall, in through to like December, January, maybe February. I can't remember exactly when it was removed. It was the duration of the construction, so that's that's when it was in. Um, so it wasn't peak biking system, um, season necessarily, but there, there was still good use by cyclists on that corridor. Um, I think, you know, we, we definitely saw um, an advantage for the bus at certain times of day when traffic was bad in the travel lanes and the, the car travel lanes on Halstead. Um, and, uh, and we did survey both bus riders, bus operators, and, um, and then active trans surveyed bike riders. And, in general, most of all of those groups liked it and uh, felt comfortable and sort of said, we'd like to see more of this, um, but not like a, it wasn't like a giant majority. Like there was still definitely some hesitancy, I think from um, not so much bus riders, <laughs> but the bus operators and the, and the cyclists, right? There was, there was still some hesitancy about it. Um, and I think, you know, as planners, we have some hesitancy of like, you know, in what conditions will it really provide an advantage to both, right? Um, as opposed to having dedicated space for each, but maybe on two parallel roads, as I was saying, or using boarding islands. Um, so I think we're still open to more pilots of that. And I think CDOT is too, we haven't found the perfect um, the perfect segment to use yet, but that's the, that's the concern. We did have just, you know, in those couple months, we did have one, Incident, no one was injured at all. It was, but a, a cycle, it was, I think during winter months, there might've been a little snow and ice and a cyclist did fall and was able to like get off the path before the, the bus was far enough behind, right? So it was able to slow down. Um, but I think that kind of thing does spook people a little bit, right? With, with some good reason. Um, not that bikes and buses aren't operating in the same lane sometimes all over the city anyway, but I think the sort of level of expectation of being able to be stress-free and have your own dedicated space and not worry as much about the other mode is maybe higher when it's a, a dedicated lane like that. So um, so there's just a lot of considerations there. I'd be interested in folks' feedback on the, on the, in the audience, um, on the call in the audience. Um, so that's it. That's all I had to talk about. Thank you so much, Jen. All really fascinating stuff. I've certainly learned new things just from hearing you three speak. Um, I wanted to ask panelists, do you have a hard stop at 1145? Can we go a few minutes longer if we have some more questions? I do not. Okay, okay great. Um, yes, so I can stick around. Okay, great. Um, so uh, audience members, feel free to drop your questions in the chat um, or the Q&A box. But in the meantime, um, I'm wondering, um, I guess you all spoke to this already, but how do you see bikes and buses complementing each other in our local transportation ecosystem? And I guess, um, how much further do we have to go? Um, where are we now kind of, and how much further do we have to go? So I, I guess I would have one initial comment, which is, you know, given our climate and the distances that some people 
like for commuting or other purposes may need to cover. Uh, in an ideal world, the sort of the bike infrastructure and the transit inf infrastructure are overlapping in a certain way so that you have a good transit alternative to, if you say you're a regular bike commuter uh, during the spring and summer, you then have a robust transit option in the winter when maybe you don't want to bike as much. So you know, that that's definitely what we strive for. But I, I do think um, it's interesting how the our, our, I think collectively we're evolving to a similar message, which is I, I definitely want to think about a complementary network as opposed to necessarily an overlapping network, particularly uh, given the very specific characteristics of our road network in Chicago and adjacent suburbs where there are alternatives, particularly to north, south and east, west streets available and, uh, you know, projects like the Dickens Greenway to me are a really great case in point where, you know, why be on Armitage if you can be on Dickens is, is kind of my philosophy there. Uh, it's just seems to me a better street to bike. So that's, I think, a crucial element that and then also how transit stations in particular are accommodating both divvy and sort of uh, private bikes. Uh, that also becomes a really important area of nexus. Commander Jen, anything to add there? Could you just repeat that? I missed the very beginning of the question. Could, could you repeat? Yeah. How do, how do you see buses and bikes kind of building off one another to, to create our, or how complement one another in our local transportation system? I'm not, I don't think I have anything to add to what I said previously. I, I, I think the second part of the question was how far do we have to go, right? I mean, on the one hand, we have a lot of streets that operate really good bus service, you know, really frequent bus service, right? Um, whether you consider it good or not depends on, you know, your perspective, but, um, and, and bikes are able to use those streets too, maybe because there's a lane, maybe because there isn't, right? So, I mean, there's multimodal use every day all over the city of Chicago, but I think if you're really striving for the ideal conditions for both modes, we, we do have a ways to go, right? <laughs> there are, there are not that many miles of dedicated bus lanes, um, there are only the, a couple of examples of these boarding islands. Um, you know, there there are more miles of bike lanes, but I, I know there's more to go there too, right? So, um, so sort of like cautious optimism, I guess, is the note I would. <laughs> I would agree with that, and I mean, I think that the challenge really comes comes from emphasizing the bus, like emphasizing the bus as a great way, as a great resource in communities, building up. I think that in, in, this is no shade on CTA or anybody else, but I think that the most like, I'm working in the Divi expansion, I'm working in a lot of different communities, right? I'm going into different neighborhoods and people's perspective on, oh, just take out all this parking and put in a bus lane seems to be quite different in some of the more like affluent areas than maybe in some of the areas that are facing like economic hardship or some other community challenges. Um, so they're sort of like the mentality about the bus and using public transit and using bikes for that matter as a way to get around, there is a stigma around around that. There are a lot of people who feel that it's not what they aspire to do, right? We have choice. We have people who are choice users of the active transportation system who, you know, they're like me. I have a car at home. I choose to bike. I choose to take transit because it's the most environmentally responsible thing for me to do. And it's also a lot more convenient than trying to park my car everywhere I go. But in other neighborhoods, there are a lot of people who are non-choice users. Um, and, and that that mean what I think what that means is that a lot of people aren't aspiring to use bikes or to use transit as their primary mode for getting around. And I think that trying to unlock that, trying to understand um, how we can see it as a more uh, desirable, convenient, faster thing. Like you said, there aren't that many bus lanes uh, in the city to make it the convenient, the safe, convenient option that everybody wants to use. So sorry, that's not a great answer. I think everybody on this call probably agrees that, yeah, we do have a long way to go, but I think it's as much of a, it's as much about perceptions and culture and attitude as it about the bus, um, as it is um, about figuring out where we're going to build these things, right? So that would be my thought. I would just add, you know, I, I understand your point, Amanda, and I, I agree, and I think part of it is the infrastructure that we build can, can, can indicate what modes we respect the most, right? As a city. And we built a lot of car infrastructure for a really long time. 
right? So, so that's part of it. I'm not going to say there aren't real conveniences in having your own car sometimes, right? I'm not going to say that, but like Certainly. you can just also tell as a pedestrian sometimes that you're not the priority mode at a particular intersection, right? Like um, same goes for bike and bus. And I'd also, that just your comment, Amanda, reminded me of my favorite part of the entire bus bike um, pilot on Halstead, which was when we surveyed um, bus riders, uh, you know, there's the own open comment, right? And one of the one of the bus riders said, I feel like a celebrity because they had their own lane and they were going past traffic, right? So, yeah, yeah. All right, we have a couple questions from the audience. Um, so this first one is, um, let's see. Uh, from Samantha about, and maybe more for Amanda, maybe Bennett, any ideas about how, about providing safer bike lock infrastructure at bus stops and train stations? Um, her concern is in a bike and ride method or would be the, or she's, Samantha's worried about the safety of right. uh, their bike uh, when, when they get back. I think the main thing for that, so some something to note is that there are a lot of CTA stations that do have bike racks within the station itself, either within the footprint or like, you know, I can, the one that comes to mind is the Logan Square stop at Milwaukee Avenue, um, where you actually can lock your bike after you've taken it in past the turnstile or past the gate that opens. Um, so there is, in some locations, it's more robust than others, of course. Um, I think when it comes to bus stops, individual bus stops and locations like that, my recommendation would be to um, to advocate you. There is, um, and I don't have the link handy, there is a way that you can go online and request a bike parking rack anywhere in the city of Chicago. There's a map where you can go in and drop a pin and it's just like a standard bike parking rack. I don't know, Julia or Maggie, if you guys are looking that up, but you can put that in. Um, so I think that having just more bike infrastructure for that parking is important and of course proper locking. I have seen at some locations they'll have like a special like locker uh, where people can have like key card access to lock up their bike and keep it locked and completely isolated from the elements and everything else. I've seen some where um, there's like a a sort of like a lid it's like you you park your bike on the rack and then there's this big cover that's like on a big like a clamshell lid that closes down over the top of it and you can lock that with your u-lock but i think some of the problems are just have to do with maintenance like um people can put up the dough to buy those and put them out but they do deteriorate over time sometimes they collect a lot of trash um so those sort of some of the balance that's being caught there my recommendation, and I hate to say it, my top recommendation is two U-locks. You know, if you know you're going to be commuting, leaving your bike at a bus stop for half the day while you go somewhere, I think double locking um, is just going to have to be an unfortunate uh, reality. So that would be my rec. I'm also seeing there's another question about um, Divi and CTA fare integration, and I heard Bennett also mention that. Um, so this is something that has been under conversation between CDOT and CTA for quite some time. Um, one of the challenges that's involved in that is also that, you know, Ventra is operated by a separate contractor from CTA and Divi is also operated by a separate contractor from CDOT. So we have these two other organizations that also need to work together from a technology point and they are doing that. Um, there is a grant, there's an FTA grant that CTA got in order to help move this forward. So um, that is in the works. I don't have any like really great juicy details that I can reveal, but just it's something to keep for, for everybody to kind of keep in mind is that the fair payment systems for CTA and Divi are fundamentally different from one another, right? You get on the CTA, you pay one fare, you pay one time, you get on, you get off. With Divi, you have to sign a, um, sign a usage agreement, right, that shows that you're fully responsible for this bike, making sure that you're bringing it back, um, and also that you don't just pay one fare, but as time goes on, you can generate usage fees and other things like that, um, and so being able to take these two kind of very different systems together and, and marry them together in a way that works is something that is totally possible. It's just that the conversation takes a little bit longer than uh, than you would think. So it's in the works, it's in the future, and everybody wants to make it happen. So that's the update on that. 
And yeah. I, I think with the last rollout of the of the last um, Ventra app, like re, redo, there was some functionality, not fair payment integration, um, right. but there was some fun functionality added where you can get to the Divi app or the Divi information through the Ventra app. So um, it's a baby step, but it's a step nevertheless. Right. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, and I, I saw a question from someone about expansion of Divi outside of Chicago, um, and I, I just would say, you know, speaking as a, a county factotum and relative to my own planning efforts, certainly the idea that, you know, expanding Divi into some adjacent communities, it already does exist in Evanston, uh, frankly, but uh, like something like Bedford Park, where it's directly adjacent, probably makes a lot of sense if we want to, you know, give people bike share access in Bedford Park, that would seem kind of like a no-brainer. Um, as you get further and further out, I'm not sure it necessarily makes as much sense uh, if like you're talking about, you know, Metro out to the fringe of the county and beyond, then it's, it's not, it's, it's sort of getting to the point where it's not necessarily as networked with the sort of core divvy, so to speak, but, you know, certainly the path of least resistance as I see it to expand bike share beyond the city limits of Chicago would probably be divvy because, you know, it's already there. And uh, Amanda and others have already got, worked out sort of the costs of expansion and things of that nature. So um, that's something we're, we're definitely interested in, in exploring more. Um, if I could, not to dominate this whole thing, but um, if, if I could speak to that, just the, the reason why we have Divi in Evanston is because the city of Evanston went in to get grant funding in order to pay for the system. And that was the same case with Oak Park. Um, so the reason why they have it is because they had residents and their municipality, they all got together and said, this is what we want for our city. And they made it happen and they set up a contract and got it approved by you know their city council and, and they moved forward on that. So um, what it is, is it's really up to the individual municipalities and communities to find someone to operate a bike share system in their city. Um, and Lyft is obviously, you know, running Divi right now. Uh, they weren't our initial operator. So um, that's... Um, I think that it would be fabulous if we had um, our bike share, a seamless, you know, system for people to be able to get, you know, for someone who lives in Skokie to be able to divvy to the train and then get on and come into downtown and then divvy to their job. I think that's ultimately what everybody wants. It definitely does require advocacy on the part of those community members to be able to raise that and um, the discussion of funds and cost and bandwidth and all of that. So, yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks all of you. Um, so there are two more questions that I think we can get to and maybe we can close out at noon. Um, so there's a question just about during the winter time with snow. So um, bus stops, sidewalks around bus stops, bike lanes. Um, like have, can you talk about anything your agencies do to help deal with that, that issue? So for the city of Chicago, it is the responsibility of adjacent property owners to clear the sidewalks um, in front of their property and adjacent to their property. Um, it is it is unlawful to shovel the snow out into the bike lane. It is unlawful to shovel the snow into a divvy station. Um, so that is uh, sort of an ongoing challenge um, when there are situations where you have uh, something like a bridge that is the responsible, it's responsibility of the city to um, address that. So you can always call 311 to call that in. Um, when it comes to bikeways specifically and particularly like barrier protected bikeways that you see that have like a concrete island that separates it. Those, um, those we, the city does have like a, a separate truck that's designed just to clear those areas. But I feel like um, along with most things, the squeaky wheel is gonna get the grease on that. So we definitely recommend contacting 311. There is a specific 311 code for you know, snow clearance or like snow or debris, I think is what it is um, blocking that bikeway. So, um, I re highly recommend everybody staying engaged. It is a part of the routine. It is part of the routine snow clearance, but as I'm sure you can imagine, um, when we have really high snow events, um, that's something that we recommend people, advocates call out and, and, and stay in contact with the city about that. Great, and then uh, another question about, about parking. Um, we know parking is complicated and, um, with the parking deal also in Chicago. Um, is there anything that your agent agencies do to, to deal with that? Like, can you replace parking somewhere else? Um, 
Any, yeah, any the, thoughts? That, that the typical thing, if there's a new design coming in and it impacts a paid parking spot that's under the last contract, um, is that a replacement um, spot has to be found in this same general area. I think technically it has to be in the same ward, but it's obviously that we try to find things. We, the city tries to find, it's not CTA that does this part of the work, but um, the city tries to find something that's, you know, around the corner, um, nearby, et cetera, right? Um, you know, is it a major barrier to putting in more bike and bus lanes? Possibly, but I think also people's just general demand for parking, whether or not it's paid or not, is <laughs> is as big or bigger of a barrier, right? So, um, so, but 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 there is at least that mechanism. Um, it's obviously hard to do that if you're doing an entire corridor, right? But if you're doing a, a, you know something at an intersection or a couple of little spots, you can move a couple spots and get that space back. Well, thank you all so much for, for staying on a little bit later than we expected. Um, you all covered so much ground and not to be too cheesy, but it seems like when we uh, talk about buses and bikes, we cover even more ground, right? So let's keep building out that network. Um, tomorrow, we're going to have a one last virtual conversation for Bike Week with um, Alderman Matt Martin of the 47th Ward. Alderman Andre Vasquez of the 40th Ward and Alderman Daniel Laspot of the 1st Ward talking about building bike infrastructure. So um, I'm just dropping the link to register for that. Uh, we also have an action alert right now, um, trying to get a, a true network of protected bike lanes built. So please take a moment and take action. Um, It'll send a letter to Mayor Lori Lightfoot, CDOT Commissioner Gia Biagi, and your local alderman. Um, and then finally, we also are still doing our bike challenge. So feel free, you can still register and log those miles that you've been riding. Um, and I believe it ends July 2nd. Is that right, Maggie? Yes, so I'm dropping the link to that as well. Um, and thank you, thank you to our panelists. Um, you all brought so much great info and it was a great conversation. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hey, thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Right Thanks. on. See you. Bye.